Praise the Lord, everyone. Good to see you in Sunday school today. We've got a pretty good crowd to get started with. I'm sure we'll have some more coming in as we go. Sure glad to see everybody here. I don't understand why people wouldn't want to come to Sunday school. That's just a, I mean, that's been a normal practice of my life, all my life. And uh, especially don't understand the parents that wouldn't want their kids in Sunday school. Because they're not going to get this out there. They're not going to get it in our regular schools for sure. And uh, a lot of times we don't have time at home. So, uh, I, you know, I think Sunday school is important. I really do. I thought about last week, uh, wonder where Sunday school was first started. I didn't do any research on it. I've never seen it in the Bible where they had Sunday school. Uh, but I did see where they have church all night, some nights in Bible, in Bible times. So uh, I, I don't know if they ever had Sunday school or not, but I know they went to the synagogue at certain times to pray and to hear teaching and preaching. I'm just glad I'm privileged to be. You know, a lot of things I learned in my growing up years in Sunday school that I've never got away from. I can still remember a lot of the teachers, that I, most all the teachers I had in Sunday school. You build a closeness and a bond in Sunday school that you don't normally build during regular service time. I'm thankful you're here in Sunday school today, and I think we're in for a great time of the Lord. Are you glad you're in church today? Let's give the Lord a big hand. I'm thankful that everything is well with us is what it is. You know, we could have a lot of problems, a lot of issues. There's been a lot of trouble this morning, but the Lord has blessed us, and we're here at church, and I'm ready to see what the Lord's got for us. Let's go ahead and stand today. We'll go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Quick mention of our request once again. Uh, Brother and Sister Cutshaw, continue to remember them. Brother Ricky Butler, good to see him. He's doing good. Sister Hudson, remember Sister, let's don't forget Sister Hudson. She was faithful here for years and years and years, and uh, her and Brother Hudson both, so let's don't forget Sister Hudson. Paul Rollison, Eli Johnson, Don Dotson, Brian West, Jonathan Ryder. Most of you know the needs on these uh, ones that I'm calling out. Uh, Mitch Dawson, Travis Mills. Elisa Grimes, Johnny Derrick, Judy Netto, uh, Daniel Bertram family, and Brother Dylan Heights, grandmother. Uh, also, Brother Jason's mother is real sick, not doing well at all, so let's remember her in her prayer. I was talking to Gene this morning uh, after we got to church, and uh, he was telling me about Hull Davis, and I don't know, I know a lot of you know Hull at the bank, Commerce Bank was at Trustmark for years, but... Uh, he was walking or jogging his routine. He's uh, a jogger and uh, runs a lot, but uh, was evidently doing his routine yesterday morning, and they found him passed out. And uh, he's still, as far as we know, unresponsive. They've called the doctors in, and Dr. Jagtap's been in and says his heart's working good, but he's just not responding to anything, still unconscious. So uh, most of you know Mr. Hull Davis, so let's lift him up in our prayers. I've done business with Hull for, I don't know, 25, 30 years or maybe longer than that. Uh, and has uh, always been a great friend. So uh, let's hold him up in our prayers this morning. We know the Lord's able to touch. We know he's able to heal. So uh, let's hold him up in our prayers this morning. Anyone else have a spoken request? Anyone else? Sister Gail. Okay, let's remember former co-worker, Sister Gail. Uh, Barbie's sick this morning. Brother Joey said she uh, had some issues with her stomach, so let's uh, ask the Lord to touch Barbie this morning. Anyone else? Uh, let's remember our service throughout the day. I'm looking forward to a great time in the Lord. It'll be what we put into it, so let's, uh, let's give it all we've got today and let's see something happen for the Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Brother Rogers, lead us today. Amen. You may be seated. Ushers can come on and get our Sunday school offerings today. The 
Lord's been faithful, hasn't he? He's been good to all of us, every one of us. I don't even have to ask you to know that the Lord's been good to you because he's been good to all of us. I was privileged to uh, listen to Brother Danny Austin uh, and his wife the other night at Living Free. I think it was last Thursday night. And uh, if you haven't heard it, if you've got uh, Facebook access, if you could go on there and listen to their testimony. Just amazing what the Lord has done for Brother Danny and his family, uh, the things he's been through and uh, the things that the Lord has seen him through. I really enjoyed it, Brother Danny. I was uplifted by y'all's testimony. And, uh, you know, we've got a lot of testimony sitting on our benches. If you just knew where a lot of us came from and a lot of the things that we were saved through and from and in, uh, it would be amazing. I mean, we could stay here all night long as I look over our congregation and just know that the Lord has brought us through some dark places. Brother Joey Gilmore, uh, y- y'all see him, how nice he always looks when he comes to church and uh, just uh, always dressed up and looks clean. And just just you think, well, he's a, probably been the best fellow in the world, and he has ever since I've known him. Uh, he was got he got most handsome when he was in Kosuth High School. What's that? Oh, it's only, only one participant, huh? But uh, no, he did really. And uh, then uh, his, I've known his mom and daddy for years, and known the whole family for many years. And uh, brother Joey uh, had a few wild oats to sow here and there, and uh, started traveling with us singing on our singing group. And I think maybe the first time he went, he just, Leon invited him just to go and uh, drove a bus. And a uh, time or two, he was videoing with us after that a few times. And uh, if you could, if you seen his old driver's license, you wouldn't, somebody had to tell you who he was. You wouldn't, you wouldn't know him uh, the way he looked back then. And I uh, think about the time that uh, we was having prayer meeting, our youth was having prayer meeting, and the old Lord tore him. Brother Joey came to prayer meeting. We'd invited him to prayer meeting with just casual friends at that time. And he came to prayer meeting and started praying. And uh, it wasn't long until he, he said, I'm ready to be baptized. And I said, well, Brother Joey's saying this. Now, he's serious. He, he ain't playing around. You know, he's, he's, he's serious about what he's doing. And uh, so we called Granddaddy that night and got him up out of bed, I think. And, uh, well, it was, I don't know, on over 8.30 to 9 o'clock, I guess. And uh, he come in to the old Lord Torm and uh, said a little something and took Brother Joey Gilmore to the baptistry and baptized him in Jesus' name. When he come up out of the water, he was speaking in tongues. And uh, the baptistry before we got done was pretty well loaded, wasn't it, Brother Joey? And uh, I was just thinking about the many testimonies that we have sitting on our benches today. Uh, of where people has been, the things we've all been through and things uh, that the Lord has saved us through and the miraculous saving power of God. His grace is good, isn't it? The grace is good. Now, I didn't have none of that in my notes. I just happened to think of that this morning. Brother Rogers has pawned this off on me again this morning. I don't know what he's trying to do to me. <clears throat> he's, <laughs> he's evidently paying Brother Levi better than I am or something. I don't know what the deal is, but... Uh, He's, <laughs> but anyway, he preached this morning. I think he preached this morning at the prison and uh, preached last Wednesday night. So Brother Levi texted me this past week. won't know if I'd fill in again or take his spot again today, which I was glad to do. Brother Rogers, glad to do it. Uh, if you, you know, this looks easy up here. You don't know what goes into a service. When a service is complete, when a service goes along and flows and Things are going good and songs are matching up and preaching is good and everything. We walk back out just high and lifted up. You have no idea what all's went on that week to put that thing together that way. It won't just happen. I promise you. That's why this Sunday school lesson is it don't just happen or it don't for me. Uh, if, if it looks easy to you, then you can probably get a job. They'll probably let you try it if you want to try it. I would encourage you to try it. If you've never been up here, you can think you can got a suitcase full of notes in about five minutes. You'll be, you'll be out if you're not careful. So, it, uh, but anyway, I've got something to talk to you about this morning. I want to speak about a subject that probably, hopefully, will relate to every one of us. 
And uh, as I've told you before, I'm no, I'm no smart guy. Uh, I'm just your old average Joe. And I got talked into this and when Brother Hodum was here uh, pastoring. He was going to be out one Sunday, and he asked me to fill in. And, and uh, I told him, I said, now, Brother Hodum, I've done everything you've asked me to do as far as I know. Uh, but I said, I, I am, I'm not a teacher. I said, I don't have anything anybody want to want to listen to. And he said, oh, I think you do, Brother Keith. You know how Brother Hodum is. He said, oh, I think you do. Put his hand on my shoulder. He said, I think you do. I think you do. I said, I want you to teach Sunday. Well, that, what do you do? You know, you can't you just you can't refuse Brother Hodum Harley. You know, he's such an humble guy. And uh, then from there, that's been a long time ago now, but from there on, I've been filling in and teaching and partial teaching and co-teaching and all this kind of stuff. But anyway, I'm glad I'm back today and ready to talk to you about something I think will uh, be of interest to you. In our circle of life, we have a lot of person, people that we consider friends. I consider every one of you out here friends, my friends. Uh, and But, you know, we only have probably two or three real close friends, just real close friends. Uh, even though we are all friends that come here and we're a close-knit church, but uh, we don't, uh, an average person don't have but about two or three just sure enough close friends uh, that they tell everything to. Daddy Bill said one time, he said, everybody likes me. He said, I ain't never had nobody tell me they didn't like me, so I'm sure everybody likes me. Well, I've had people tell me before they didn't like me. I ain't been that lucky. I've had them tell me to my face they didn't. And uh, hey, it didn't bother me too much because I, I didn't care for them too much, just to tell you the truth. But uh, everybody's probably not going to like us, but it's a good thing to have friends and uh, have close friends. But uh, there's, as I said, there's probably only two or three close, very best friends that you have, people that you can share things with and joy with and uh, problems with and those kind of things. Uh, I've got two or three real close friends that I consider just, you know, just, well, they're actually closer than my family are, a lot of my family are. And uh, I know that I can, I've got confidence in them. They have confidence in me, I hope. I think they do. And uh, I know I can tell them some problems that I have and some struggles that I'm going through and some failures and stumbles. And uh, I know I can discuss that with them, and it never gets any further. That's a true friend. That's a very best friend, somebody that you can confide in and uh, tell them, you know, that, look, I'm having a problem with this, and they ain't going to hold that against you. They're going to help you pray or help you get through it or encourage you or uh, tell you, hey, I've, I've been there too before, and this is what, this is what I've done to help get through it. They're going to call and check on you, and they ain't going to gossip about you. They ain't going to tell things about you. Uh, they're not going to thank you any smaller of you because of that, because you had an issue. And I've got, uh, you know, I've got a few friends that I could call probably any time of the day or night and say I'm broke down somewhere. And they wouldn't, they wouldn't even ask me, why are you there? Where are you, you know, they just want to know where you're at and I'll, I'll be right there. You know, give me a few minutes and I'll be right on. And uh, I've got a few friends that I will, that have confided in me before and, uh, you know, I'd go to my grave for I told anybody anything about it. I'll take that to my grave because they have confidence in me as a friend. Uh, we've all had some hard times and stuff. I don't think we're all on cloud nine every day. Uh, at least I know I'm not, not every day. Most of the time I'm feeling pretty good, but every day I'm not. I want to talk to you on a subject this morning called the faith of a friend. The faith of a friend. Uh, and the Bible says that every one of us has a measure of faith or are given a measure of faith. And he also tells us that it is impossible to please God without faith. Without faith, that it's impossible to please God. So you, we've all got to have some faith. But I, I'll just be frank with you. There's been times in my life where I had very little faith. Maybe you haven't ever been to that spot. Uh, but there's been times when it was a struggle to pray. Uh, I've had uh, valleys that I've walked through that uh, I, di I didn't have a lot of faith that I was going to 
make it through it, just tell you the truth. I was begging for help. I prayed for help, but as far as just having faith and, uh, you know, jumping from mountains to mountains, uh, I've, I've had times where praying was hard. I don't know if you've ever had those times or not. I've had times, I think we're all just alike in this, but uh, I know life is not fair to us, and a lot of times we have some issues uh, and things that come up in our life. I remember when uh, Mom and Dad got killed in 1997 on Christmas Day, that was some of the hardest times of my life I ever, ever went through. And they were a lot of days that uh, I, I didn't have a lot of, uh, I didn't have a lot of encouragement to pray. I prayed out of, uh, out of necessity, and I prayed because I knew that's where the only help, the source of help was going to come from. I prayed because I knew in these kind of hard times, that's what you need to do. That's what I'd been taught is pray. But as far as me feeling like praying, I didn't feel like praying. And uh, I had a lot of questions. And uh, I, I never questioned God's uh, timing or question his, uh, why he made the choice to take them. But I did question why, why would you take people of this, you know, because I knew how, what kind of people they were. I've seen them uh, do without to, so other people could have food. I've seen them pay people's electric bill when we barely could was making it ourselves. And I've seen him go and preach. And I mean, I knew how they lived. I lived with them at home. If you don't know how somebody is, you live with them. You find out everything about them, good and bad, when you live with them. That's the way they were. And uh, there for even months, uh, you know, it was, it was hard to pray. It was hard to get past that, just, just like your struggles in life. Some struggles are hard to get over and hard to get past. No, I never thought about quitting or giving up, but I just didn't feel like I was on 100%, you know. I didn't feel like I was 100%, uh, just everything was 100%. Then even through all of that, right at the, after two or three months, we uh, found out that the gentleman that hit them were, uh, had filed a lawsuit against the estate. Well, mom and daddy didn't have no money. Well, they didn't have anything, I didn't, you know. The house they lived in was about it. But, uh, and their insurance had already paid the boy's car off. He didn't have any insurance, of course, and had suspended license driving DUI, uh, you just name it, he had it stacked up on him. And uh, then mom and dad's insurance had to pay uh, for his vehicle because they had full coverage insurance that already done that. And then he came back and sued the estate because he said he had his front teeth messed up. And uh, <clears throat> I dealt with all that for several, several months, and I wouldn't even tell my family uh, my brothers and sisters, when the court dates were, I would just go do the deposition, and I'd tell them afterwards, you know, this I had to go do this and go do that. So it was a lot of days that were dark uh, that could have been depressing and could have, you know, that could tear your mind mentally down. And I thought uh, during those times, I thank God for two or three friends that I don't have to tell them nothing. They just know what I'm going through, Brother Nathan. And they, will, they might see you out, and they wouldn't even have to say nothing. They just put their arms around you, hug your neck, I'm here if you need me. That is a true close friend. I didn't have to tell them anything. They didn't have to tell me anything more than that, but I knew I had them. I knew I had them at my back. I knew they were praying for me to get through it. So that's what I want to talk about. The faith of, the, of a friend some days are the only thing that will get us through. And what we've always heard, or I've always heard, is your faith, your faith, and sometimes a close friend can tell you even things that you don't want to hear, but you know they're telling you for your good. They're not going to try to hurt you just because they're telling you these things. So let's read uh, in Proverbs 27, and verse 1. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Let another man praise thee, and not thy own mouth, a stranger, and not thine own lips. A stone is heavy, and the sand weighty, 
But a fool's wrath is heavier than them both. Wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous. But who is able to stand before envy? Open rebuke is better than secret love. Now notice verse 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Now that is a deep saying right there. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. But the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. The kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Now, I know the Bible says greet each other with a holy kiss, but I'll just be frank with you. If it ain't holy, I don't care about you slobbering on me, do you? I really don't. I just soon not have it. But the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Verse 7 says, The full soul loath and honeycomb, but to the hungry soul every bitter thing is sweet. As a bird that wandereth from her nest, so is a man that wandereth from his place. Now notice this, ointment and perfume rejoice the heart, so doth the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty counsel. Thine own friend and thy father's friend forsake not, neither go into thy brother's house in the day of, the, of thy calamity, for better is a neighbor that is near than a brother afar off. Now it's about two or three things here that I want us to think about. In these verses I just read. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. That verse right there is kind of, uh, when you think about that, that's kind of a tough little verse right there. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. And then the next thing I want you to notice is the sweetness of a friend by hearty counsel. And the third thing I want you to notice is a friend can stick closer or be closer than even a brother. And Proverbs also tells us this, that Jesus is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. John's gospel says, Greater love has no one or no other person than to lay down his life for a friend. For a friend. A friend in need is a friend indeed. Have you ever heard of that? There was a woman and a small child lived across the road from an elderly couple. And... Uh, the little boy would go over there and visit quite often, just walk across the street and visit the elderly couple, kept them company, and they liked to see him come. But the elderly lady passed away, and uh, the old man was left there by himself. And the little boy didn't go over there for several days, and one day his mama said, Son, you need to go over and visit your neighbor. Go over and visit our neighbor and see if you can cheer him up a little bit. He lost his wife. The little boy was only about 8 or 10 years old. He said, go across and see if you can cheer, cheer him up. So he went across the road, and in a few minutes he came back, and his mama said, well, how was Mr. So-and-so doing? Fine. He, she said, well, did you go over and cheer him up? I said, what did you all talk about? He said, we didn't talk about anything. She said, well, what, what happened? She said, he said, I just went over there and got in a swing and helped him cry a little bit. Sometimes that's all we need from a friend. Just somebody just to kind of lean on just a little bit. They don't, they don't have to necessarily say anything. Galatians says that to bear you one another's burdens, so fulfill the law of Christ. Bear you one another's burdens, so fulfill the law of Christ. The faith of a friend. Proverbs says, iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. So let's look in the New Testament. Uh, most every time in the New Testament when Jesus heals someone, not most, not every time, but a lot of the times, you'll remember this, he'll say to them after it's over, thy faith has made thee whole. Thy faith has made thee whole. Or, you know, you've had a little faith and uh, I've granted your need to him. A lot of times we heard Jesus say this to the different ones that he healed. A lot of times. Do you think it's possible for a friend's faith to get you healed. Well, it's happened. It's happened on several occasions. Uh, and I'm going to tell you about a couple of them this morning. And the only gospel that I can find this mentioned is, is in Mark. And I'm not sure why that the other gospels didn't talk about this. But uh, I find it in Mark.
And uh, Jesus has just begun his ministry. He's went out and he's called all of his disciples, and uh, they're following him. And Jesus goes to the synagogue, and there he starts casting out unclean spirits. And there was a spirit there that cried out against him, and he said, Let us alone. I know thee, thou art the Holy One of God. This is the spirit that's speaking out and talking to Jesus. Uh, This is an unclean spirit. And Jesus rebuked him and said, Hold thy peace and come out of him. The Bible said the unclean spirit tore the man and cried with a loud voice, but it came out. It had to come out. Listen, folks, the devil is real. Uh, Spirits are real. Demonic spirits are real. Uh, Don't ever play with that kind of stuff uh, because it's it's nothing to kid around with or play with. Uh, if now greater is he that's within us than he that's within the world. The Lord can overcome those things, but you don't want to get scarred up and maimed with those things. Uh, I, I don't have time to go through this, but a lot of you have uh, heard uh, Sister Charlotte Sachs. I haven't talked to her in many, many years now, several years. This will be Brother Bill Cutshaw's oldest daughter. We came home from, I don't have... Time, but I, need, I want to tell you this right here. We'll get to this in just a second. And some of it, and I'm not telling anything that she hadn't uh, publicly told before, but some of you that's, uh, that hadn't been here before or for just a short time may not have heard it, but we got home on a Sunday afternoon. Mother usually cooked uh, Sunday lunch for us, got up early and cooked, so we'd go by there after church and have lunch and, you know, visit and then turn around and get back come back to church that night, but this particular Sunday afternoon we was there, and we just sat down for a Sunday lunch, and the phone, telephone rang, that's when people still had landlines, so uh, Daddy got up and answered the phone, and uh, we could overhear the conversation, it was just a short piece to the, uh, where the phone was there from the kitchen dining table where we were sitting, and uh, he answered the phone, he said, well, hey, Brother Higdon, how are you doing? Brother Higdon was over in the Philippines at this time. Uh, foreigner, missionary, and uh, he said, uh, I could tell something wasn't just kosher. Daddy was listening and talking, and he said, well, sure, we'll help you pray. And uh, the conversation just kept getting lengthier and lengthier, and uh, then we realized that something serious was going on, something bad serious was going on. And Brother Higdon was there with Brother Bill Cutshaw's oldest daughter, which was living over in Hawaii at that time. And she had uh, innocently, I think, got involved with some, uh, something's called healing hands. And it was a, uh, I don't really know how to describe all this to you. It was uh, more of in the spirit world, uh, not, not, Not Jesus spiritual, but it was in the spiritual world. And they was doing something, uh, some kind of way with their hands during meditations. uh, It was a type of, I don't know if it's a type of yoga or a type of voodoo, seance type things. But it was all that was involved in what she was into, but it's called healing hands. And she had got involved in that until a devil, an unclean spirit had just took over her life. And uh, her husband had gotten in touch with Brother Higdon. I don't know how that all wound up, but he, he had got him over there to pray for her. And when Brother Higdon started praying, he knew instantly that she was, had an unclean spirit, that she was, had a devil in her. And uh, as I say, I'm not divulging anything that she hadn't divulged in public also. But when Dad got on the phone, Brother Higdon said, Brother Danny Frazier, I need you to help me pray. And so Daddy starts praying right there on the phone. Uh, distance don't matter to God. Do you realize that? It, it don't matter if somebody is in the Philippines and we're over here in the United States. Those prayers are travel. So Daddy got to praying, and it was, I mean, it wasn't like a, you know, thank you, Lord, for this day and bless this food. I mean, he done got serious. You could tell he, we were uh, sitting around the the dinner table, but wasn't nobody eating. I mean, that's how serious it was. And uh, all of a sudden, I hear Daddy start speaking in tongues and casting the devil out. 
This is going over on the phone. And Brother Higdon said, Brother Danny says she's, she's levitated up off the table. So she's, her whole body's lifting up off the table. And all of a sudden, that unclean spirit started talking over the phone. And it, it said, leave me alone, Danny Frazier. I know who you are, Danny Frazier. I know who you serve, Danny Frazier, so leave me alone. Well, that just, that just made Danny Frazier that much bolder. And, uh, I mean, it was, it was serious there for about two hours. We could hear Daddy praying and Brother Higdon praying, and, uh, but they prayed that unclean spirit out of her. But don't never think that they're not real because they're real. They will take over your life, folks, if you'll let them. You know, we better have the Spirit of God on the inside of us. And we better know when we start messing around with this kind of stuff that we're, we're getting off a little too deep. This, they will get a hold of you. The Bible says, none of this has been in my notes this morning, but I just feel like telling you, the Bible says this. When an unclean spirit leaves a person, and that spirit's good and clean, I mean, that vessel is good and clean. There ain't nothing left in there. It's clean. That spirit goes out and walks to and fro. And he comes back. You know what he finds? An a empty vessel. But it's clean. See, I don't get that all the time. Everybody says, well, I, I'm clean. I'm clean. I'm clean. You better be full. That's the main thing is you better get full. It's not how clean you're living. It's how full you keep it on the inside. Because that unclean spirit comes back and he brings seven more. Worse than he is. And he dwells inside that vessel. And the latter state is worse than the first. That's what the book says. Well, well, as I said, we were talking about friends. I don't know how I got off on that. Sorry about that. Jesus is preached in the synagogue. He's cast out the unclean spirit. He goes by Peter's mother-in-law's house and heals his mother-in-law. Uh, and then... The Bible says that everyone brought all the diseased and even more people that were possessed with devils. And I love what the Bible says. Many were healed of divers diseases, and he cast out many devils and would not let them speak because they knew him. He wouldn't let them speak. I mean, that's some, taking some authority over Satan. It's odd to me that sometimes the devil comes to church more often than some of our saints do. But he shows up in the synagogue on a regular basis. Jesus got up early the next morning and slips out to pray. The Bible says to be alone and pray. And Peter comes and finds him and said, Jesus, people's thronging about the house. They're coming to seek you. The Bible says that Jesus went back to the synagogue and cast out more devils. Looks like to me there's a lot of devils in the church, don't it? People don't want to come to church because there's hypocrites there. I tell you, worse than that, there's devils there. They're just the regular old devils. Jesus, after a few days, the Bible says, came back to Capernaum. And that's where we'll pick up this reading in Mark chapter 2 and verse 1. And again, he entered into Capernaum after some days. And it was noised abroad that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. This, they got a crowd, folks. They got a big crowd. And they came, and they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born to four. Everybody say, the faith of a friend. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, that means for so many people pressing around the, wasn't CNN there or Fox. But when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. Now get the picture. Here's a house full, not only a house full, it's an overflowing crowd. They're out in the yard, got the door blocked, got the windows blocked. People just as far as you can see. 
I don't know if you realize this or not, but in the Bible, when the Bible speaks of a multitude of people or a great number of people, it's talking about in the tens to 15,000 people. 5,000, one occasion, 10,000, that's a lot of people. That's a whole lot of people. Well, we don't know how many was here, but we do know that there were so many people that they couldn't get them all, couldn't even get them close to the house. Jesus was preaching. All of a sudden, stuff starts falling out of the roof. Here comes a board. Here comes a plank. Here comes some thatch, some clay, a piece of tile. What's going on? I look up, and here's four guys looking down. I believe, it's, I believe we're right on top of them. We'll set him right down here. What's going on up there? There's a hole in the roof. Four guys looking down across the roof. There's a guy one time that came to the altar. Every time he'd come to the altar, he'd start looking up when he's praying. He'd say, I see Jesus. I see Jesus. I see Jesus. Every time he'd come to pray, I see Jesus. So some guys, little boys, they're mean boys in the church. I kept watching him every time he'd come up to pray. He'd always look straight up and say, I see Jesus. So I cut him a little hole out in the cell text. The next night, the guy come up there to pray. He looked up and said, I see Jesus. And them little boys put a, a mask up over that hole, looking down at him. He said, now, folks, sure enough, I did see something that time. And that's about what this was. This is, sure enough, I was seeing something this time. There was a hole in the roof. And here's four guys looking down over. And verse 5 says, when Jesus saw the man with the palsy's faith, no, I don't say that. It says, when Jesus saw their faith, speaking of the four gentlemen that had brought the man, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there was a certain, there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. That's a serious thing to do when you're around the Lord, start doubting. And this is what they reason. Why does this man thus speak blasphemings? Who can forgive sins but God only? Well, this was God only. This was God in the flesh. That's exactly what he was. I just didn't realize that. This was God that, that they was looking at. And they reasoned in their heart, didn't even say it out loud, just had some reasoning in their heart, some doubt in their heart. And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason you see these things in your heart? I bet they were surprised, don't you? How did he know what I was thinking? Whether it's easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, and take up thy bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up the bed, and go thy way, unto thine own house. And immediately he rose, took up his bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed, and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. I imagine they haven't. They had never seen that before. Now a couple of things here I want us to notice was Jesus not healing all the different diversities of diseases there? Yes, he was. I just read you that, just showed you that, where he was healing all manner of diseases. Why did this one person stick out so much? Two reasons. Jesus first said, thy sins be forgiven thee. <clears throat> This is what the scribes were thinking in their heart. Jesus can say, Brother Rogers, your sins be forgiven thee. How do we know they've forgiven? Jesus said that. Yeah, he said it, but we didn't see, we didn't see nothing. The man's still sick on the bed. That's what the scribes were saying. You, didn't, you hadn't showed us nothing. You just you took authority and said, thy sins be forgiven thee, but the man ain't moved. He's still on the bed sick. Jesus perceived this in his heart. He knew their thoughts. He said, just so you will know that I've got the power to forgive sins. I say to the sick man, arise 
and get up and take your bed and go. We never find a record before where the faith of a friend heals someone until this time. That's the second thing I want us to know. Every time before, Jesus is always telling the person, thy faith has made thee whole. But if you'll notice this passage of Scripture, he never spoke to the man of the palsy that we know of. He never said, hi, how you doing? Uh, I hate you're sick. Even after the man of the palsy was healed and the man left the building, took up his bed immediately, the Bible says, and, and left, went to his house. We never see where they had any conversations between each other at all. The only thing that made got the man of the palsy sick was the faith of the four friends. The faith of the four friends. That's what, that's what got the man's well. So here's a sobering thought to you. Reckon your neighbor or your friend that works closest with you might be healed if we just done a little faith on our part. If we shared a little bit on our part. We see people and have contact with people every day. These four people that brought this man of a palsy were not content when they got there and seen that the yard was full, the house was full, they could have looked at him and said, you know we're your best, best friends. We're your four best friends you got. Well, nobody else even told you down here on this bed. I mean, that was the task, just getting him down there on the gurney or whatever, what it was. But they wasn't deterred when they got down there. They didn't tell the man, look, man, we tried. We done the best we could. We brought you all the way here. We just... You can see the crowd, you know, they ain't no, they just ain't no way to get in. Ain't no way to get there. There ain't no elevators. There ain't no back door, no exits. We, we, oh, I hate it. You know, I, I know if we could have got there, we would have got you healed, but we've done all we could do. No, they didn't take no for an answer. It was a near impossible task to get somebody on a gurney up to a roof. And we got good ladders and scaffolds now. That'd be a job for us right now. Imagine them trying to hoist him up or get him up on the roof. And then to get him back down, lowered back down. I mean, this was a task. But when Jesus saw their faith, the faith of these four, he said, I'm going to heal the man of the palsy. The faith of a friend. The faith of a friend. There's another story in Luke 7 where Jesus is back in Capernaum. There's a certain centurion that was sick, the Bible says, to near death. And his servants beckoned Jesus to come to this house and heal this man. So Jesus goes with him, and but when he approaches the house, the centurion sends his servants out and says, Lord, we're not worthy that thou should come under the roof, but if you will speak the word, our master will be healed. When Jesus heard this from the friends, he marveled and said, Not... No, he said, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. He wasn't talking about the great faith of the man that was laid in there sick. He never saw him. He never got into the house. The servants came out and said, Centurion said, you, you don't need to walk under our roof. You're, we're not worthy to even have you in. And then Jesus said, I ain't seen this much faith. No, not in all Israel. Whose faith was he talking about? It was the faith of those servants, those faith of the friends. The faith of a friend, there's a valuable lesson here that we'll learn this. Our faith can and plays a big, important part. And, you know, that's the reason we pray for people. That's the reason we give in prayer requests. That's the reason we put people on a prayer list is, uh, is pray for a friend. I've got a little story here. My time is already gone. I believe it goes a little quicker some Sundays. This Sunday's one of them. I got sidetracked too much. Sorry about that. Let me read you a story, and we'll just we'll finish the lesson up. This is a very good story. It fits so well with my lesson today. After a few of the casual of the usual Sunday evening hymns, the church pastor slowly stood up and walked to the pulpit. And before he gave his sermon for the evening, he briefly said, "Let me introduce a guest minister who is in our service this evening." In his introduction, the pastor told the congregation that the guest minister was one of his dearest childhood friends, and he wanted to have just a few minutes to share with the church. The, the elderly gentleman walked up to the pulpit and began to speak. 
A father and his son and a friend of his son were sailing off the Pacific Ocean, he began, when a fast storm blocked and attempted to get back to shore. The waves were so high that even the father, as an experienced sailor, could not keep the boat upright and the boat capsized. The old man hesitated for just a moment as he looked at the crowd, making eye contact with two teenagers that sat on the front bench. Grabbing a rescue line, the preacher said, a father had to make the worst decision in his life. His own son he knew was a Christian, but his friend's son's friend he knew was not a Christian. So for just a few seconds, the father thought and then threw his lifeline to the friend. And his son sank. And he waved at his son and said, I'll see you in heaven. The father yelled out, I love you, son, and throw the lifeline out to the friend. By this time, the two teenagers on the front row were sitting straight up in their seat. The father continued, how great is the love of God that he would do the same for us. He threw out the lifeline for us. And then he sat down. The pastor slowly came to the pulpit and preached his sermon, but after the sermon was over, the two young teenage boys came up to the elderly gentleman and said, that was a nice story, sir, but I don't think it's very realistic for a father to give up his only son's life in hopes that another will somehow become a Christian. The old man said, well, son, you've got a point there. And a big smile broadened his face. It sure isn't very realistic, is it? But here I am today to tell you this story, and it gives me a glimpse of what it is for God to give up his only son you see, I was the father. Your pastor was the friend that I threw the lifeline to. A friend, the faith of a friend is important, folks. The faith of a friend is important. Your faith that you have for your three or four closest friends could be what them gets them to healing or even to salvation. Now, that's a sobering thought. That'll make you really want to be what you need to be to a friend. The faith of a friend is important. Your faith for your friend is important, folks. It's very important. Well, let's give the Lord a big hand. I see we are out of time already. <laughs> Hope I said something that 